We're going to talk about offering correction because I couldn't think of a more exciting and fun thing to talk about than that. <laughs> it, I think it's probably one of the most unenviable tasks that we're called to address in our faith, and that is the correction of an erring fellow Christian. And now, I'm going to say this up front, that this mostly falls to people that are um, mature and are experienced and not necessarily somebody that's new, Right because you don't necessarily know all the things that you need to know in order to offer the correction. So, um, not that it isn't, is impossible, uh, and sometimes we're called on to do things that we have to do, but for the most part, um, this is, you know, and as you're going to see from the examples, uh, the people that are doing the correcting are, uh, like, Jesus and... Titus and Paul, you know, these, those are some people that um, we're going to talk, talk about uh, as they sh show how you're supposed to do it. And, and, and it's, a, like I said, it's an unenviable task and it has to be done with care and you have to be um, cognizant of a, of a few different things because you don't want to fall into another category, uh, which we're going to talk about in our first verse. Um, and that is being a divisive person, right? Because because being a um, somebody that is called to make a correction can also become somebody that is divisive or is contentious or could be factious, uh, and we could find ourselves doing that. Um, I know when I was younger, back in the day, um, <clears throat> if I heard somebody say something wrong or that I didn't agree with. I'd be the first person to like ram it down their throat, you know, just like <laughs> I remember being in college and uh, having some pretty liberal professors and uh, like liberal with scripture, not like liberal politically. Okay, we'll just say it's a little different, but I'm um, getting super incensed and angry and calling them out on it, you know, and telling them that their book isn't any good and all this other kind of stuff. And it's like some people had to pull me inside and say, you know, you might be right, but what you're doing isn't helping that person at all, and you could be wrong, and they've been around for a while, and you never know, and all this other stuff. So, I, I mean, we have to be careful the way we do things and the, how we say things. Um, and I'm going to go into a little bit of why that is, but that's later on. So first, let's, let's talk about this verse here, uh, Titus 3, 9 through 11. It says, but avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and strife and disputes about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. So they're worth exactly zero. Unprofitable, worthless. Reject a factious man after a first and second warning, knowing that such a man is perverted and is sinning, being self-condemned. So you can see there is a controversy or there's argument or something that's going on, but then Paul is telling Titus to confront that person or to offer a correction to that person. He says to not only do it once, but do it twice, and then strike three, you're out, right? I mean, he says to try to try three times. After that third time, if it's not successful, um, then reject them, being perverted and sinning and self-condemned. Um, just as an aside, you might have a King James Version. Anybody still use a King James? Maybe some people at home, they use a King James Version. Um, then you're going to see a different word there. You're going to see the word heretic. Um, and, and that's from the Greek word heretikon, right? Because, of course. And then what that means, okay, now and what it meant then are different. And that's why modern translations do not use the word heretic. Uh, heretic, heretikion, um, or heretikon meant um, basically that somebody's causing division or strife, or as you might you might say, factious, as in creating factions. But today, what it means is somebody is teaching false doctrine. Now, somebody could be a heretikon because they're teaching false doctrine, because they are false. 
but it could be for a number of other reasons as well. Like, I don't like that person because they have a bad haircut and they've always had a bad haircut and they should never, ever be allowed to exist because of that horrible, awful haircut and I hate it so bad. You know, and nobody should like them. Everybody should ostracize that person because they just look horrible and it makes me sick to my stomach every time I look at them, right? So that, that could be factious, right? Um, but it, it doesn't have to be just on doctrine. And in, in the example, it, it's probably not anything significant as far as doctrine is concerned. They're talking about things that don't matter, like genealogies and things about the law, things that are unprofitable and worthless. It's kind of like arguing about what what color is better on a car, you know, this kind of stuff. You know, it doesn't matter. Um, so that's why a lot of these modern translations don't put heretic there and, uh, and instead use divisive or factious. So getting back to this passage, though, um, it notes that we should not get into disputes and arguments over unimportant issues, right? And that's kind of a warning from the opposite side. So if you're thinking about offering correction, is that correction worth it? I mean, is, is what that person doing necessarily need to be corrected? Uh, or do we just not like it? You know, um, if we don't agree with somebody or we don't like somebody for some reason, and there's lots of things that can cause that, right? That doesn't mean that they should be corrected just because we don't like what they say. And that's essentially um, what he's saying here. You know, if they're saying something that we just don't appreciate or we don't think is nice, like, you know, maybe they like postmodern art and they're just really into Jackson Pollock and that kind of stuff and, and, and we hate it and we think it's horrible, then do we really need to go up to them and tell them that their taste in, in modern art is horrible and bad? You, you know, what I think is funny is um, I do watch like a number of <laughs> religious videos on YouTube and I find it kind of amusing that there's a lot on there saying that like modern art is a sin and it doesn't belong in a church building. <laughs> um, I, I'm not going to say how I feel about that because I, I just think the whole thing's kind of ridiculous, but I could not believe there's so many videos about it on YouTube about how many people are just really bent out of shape about it that, you know, uh, impressionistic or any type of art that's not super re realistic is just bad. It's just evil, sinful, and wrong. Um, it's a thing, though. I mean, I can see some of their points, but do we really need to correct people on that? Do we really need to go out there and say, you know, you're sinning by making this lily slightly obscured from its actual, uh, what it actually looks like, you know? Uh, anyway, whatever that. Just for your information, that's one of those things that I feel is definitely one of those things that people should not be arguing about. Anyway, it, it does, though, tell us that um, we do need to offer correction or stop people from being factious. Uh, not to stir, you know, we're not there to stir the pot, uh, we're, and, and we shouldn't create trouble, trouble where none exists, right? Disunity is bad, um, especially when it's done for a personal gripe or a benefit. Um, but it does say that we need to correct them. And uh, what Paul says is very similar to what Jesus says, right? He says, correct them once and twice, and then a third time they're gone. Well, Jesus gives them one more try than, than Paul. <laughs> uh, he says in Matthew 18, 15 through 17, he says, if your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. And that's important, right? Because a factious or divisive person is not going to do it in private. The point of being factious is to get my little group against your little group and to call you out for your badness. Uh, and that, that's what the point of being factious is. But he says, Jesus says first, to go to somebody in private. And says, and if he listens to you, you have won your brother. So hey, bonus, no problem, right? But if he does not listen to you, then take uh, one or two more with you so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. And if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church, right? So that's one, two, and then you tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen to even the church, then let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. So that's one more than what Paul was saying. But you get the general idea, right? In, in both instances of Paul and Jesus' command, 
that a person is in sin or that they're doing something that's wrong, uh, it needs to be ad addressed if they're teaching some kind of false doctrine and they need to be confronted and, and stopped, right? And you can't just let someone stand up and teach things that are false. But it has to have, or ha it should follow, some type of process, right? And both Paul and Jesus briefly line out some type of process that should be followed. And, and people should be dealt with fairly, right? People should feel like you're being fair with them and that they're not being singled out. Uh, and people should also be given the benefit of the doubt. That's why Paul says, you know, go to that person two times, and Jesus says, go to that person, then take some friends, and then take to the, go to the, with the whole church, right? You're, you're, you're giving them the benefit of the doubt that they maybe really don't understand you or they don't believe what you're telling them is the truth, so you're trying to give them an opportunity to do the right thing. Um, there's an example of Paul offering correction, too. And this one, he just does it out in the open because he doesn't have a choice. He has to, right? He's in this particular situation where it's an open sin and people are being hurt and ostracized by the sin that's being committed. And so it's kind of like watching somebody. This is not as bad necessarily as robbing somebody, but it essentially, essentially has the same effect in that this is, an on, this is a sin happening right in front of your face and it's continuing to happen, so he has to go and interrupt it and stop it in its tracks so that those people that are the victims of the sin no longer are being affected by it, right? And that's what, what he does. And if you look at Galatians 2, 11 through 14, he explains it, what Paul is doing with Peter. Uh, it says, but when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, right? That's out in the open, because he stood condemned. For prior to coming of uh, certain men from James, he used to eat with Gentiles. But when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. So he was acting like the Gentiles were dirty and bad, right? And the rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by the hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, in the presence of all, if you, being a Jew, live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? So why are you making the people these people that have done nothing wrong, that are doing nothing wrong, why is it that you are making them feel inferior, like they're dirty, like they're bad? Why are you acting like you can't associate with them? You know, remember Jesus' um, parable of the Good Samaritan? You know, how the people were, the, the, the Jewish uh, Pharisees were stepping over, the priest was stepping over the, the injured dead person and just like leaving him there. Like, oh man, I can't touch him. I'd be unclean if I did that. But then the Samaritan goes and does the right thing and helps that person. You know, this is a lot like that. You just, you know, these people are, they're, they're treating other people badly. It's kind of like high school, right? When you have these certain cliques, at least it was like in high school like this when I was in high school, you had these certain groups and there's like the cool kids and the cool kids could never be caught talking to this less cool kid. You know what I mean? And, and, and if you did, that would that would kind of hurt your status with all your bros. Oh, you were hanging out with so and so. Uh, isn't that person kind of like below your uh, below your level? Shouldn't they be hanging out with these other people instead? You know? Uh, like, oh, you're a jock and you're hanging out with the nerds, you know, what's wrong with you, man? Um, that, that was big in my school. <laughs> there was a lot of that going on. And my school was pretty small, too, so you figure that out. But that, that's kind of how it is. There's this clique forming, and they're like, oh, you shouldn't associate with those dirty Gentile people. They're gross, um, and you can hang out with us, and we're, we're going to do the, the right thing over here. And they can just look up to us and wish they were as cool as we are, you know? So that's why Paul goes over to Peter and he immediately stops him. He says, you know, you're being a hypocrite and you live like the Gentiles yourself. You live like those people and then you're pretending, you're LARPing being a Jew, right? But you're not a Jew anymore. So we can see plainly from just these few examples that I've mentioned that it is critical to correct false teaching. 
And it's critical to stop ongoing sin in the church. What we also see is, though, that it is not necessarily the simplest and easiest thing to do. And sometimes we could take things too far if we're wrong. And if we're going and trying to make a correction that doesn't need to be made. And the example of the factious person is particularly informative because it's telling us that being divisive for division's sake is bad, it's evil, it's wrong. And ostracizing or condemning people simply because they do not agree with everything that we think is also wrong. So pick your battles, and those battles should belong to the Lord, right? You know, everybody knows that song. So when you pick a battle, that better be the Lord's battle. It should be something that God wants us to do, not something that we want to do. It should not be for us. It should be all to the glory of God, right? That should be the motivation. Um, Catching people, like with gotcha moments, uh, using those kind of opportunities to make yourself look better, being a hypocrite and shaming people with different but not wrong beliefs are all things that are wrong. All things that we should not do. And they are things that were particularly popular among one group of people in the New Testament in the time of Jesus, and that is the Pharisees, right? Always waiting and looking to pounce on everything that Jesus did and every little thing that they could find some kind of little disagreement with they would pounce on it, wouldn't they? And they would try to make an example out of Jesus. And every time it would blow up in their face because they were also wrong. But that's the way they lived, right? That's what they did. Oh, you ate a piece of grain off the corner of a field on the Sabbath day? That's bad, you know? Oh, you healed that man who was born blind? On the Sabbath, oh, that's that's bad. You shouldn't do that ever. Oh, you're eating with some people that you're trying to change their life because you know they need help, and you're actually going to the people that need it. That's bad. They're dirty, bad people. You shouldn't do that. You know, every time they they try to to get him, and and it blows up in their face, and they end up showing themselves to be wrong. And that's some place where we do not want to be. We don't want that to be us. We do not want to be Pharisees of the New Testament, do we? But we do want to stop open sin and corruption and false teaching uh, when we see it. So we have a responsibility to the gospel, a a responsibility to God to do these things, to do the right thing. And um, I'm going to take us to another passage now uh, from Matthew chapter 7, 1 through 5. It's do not judge, right? Right? Because this is the favorite one of everybody that doesn't want to be confronted. But you, you know, we just earlier, didn't we talk about Jesus talking about uh, going to a brother that's sinning and then taking witnesses and then bringing it before the church? That's the same Jesus that's saying this here. And now why do do these things conflict? Judge not lest you be judged, you know? Everybody's probably heard that at one time in their life, um, at least. No, they don't conflict, because when you don't proof text this thing or use it as a proof text, then it becomes a lot more obvious what's going on here. Uh, and it's, it's more of an attitude problem than it is a judgment thing. It's the kind of judging that is wrong, right? Uh, as a matter of fact, if you keep reading beyond here, uh, Jesus talks about not casting your pearls before swine, right? So how do you determine that? You have to make a judgment, don't you? I would think you would. Uh, So he's not talking about judgment in general, but this type of judging. Uh, So we'll we'll just look at it, right? Matthew 7, 1 through 5, it says, Do not judge so that you will not be judged. For in the way, in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. And then he says, why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck 
out of your brother's eye. And you see it there again, you hypocrite. In the way that you judge, judge others, you will also be judged, right? Yes, it clearly states, judge not lest you be judged, right? But then Jesus elaborates on what that means exactly. And what it means is to not correct someone in a hypocritical and self-serving manner, right? To make yourself out like you're better than somebody because that is the last thing that we should do. Jesus is basically saying that you should not be divisive or factious or looking to correct people as a way to elevate yourself, which is exactly what the Pharisees were doing. And that's who he was talking to when he was saying that, right? And we kind of get this, right? Um, anybody ever been pulled over by a police officer when they're driving and they are unintentionally speeding slightly over the speed limit, you know? It's like 36 and a 35, you know, and you just made a mistake once. That's everybody, right? Everybody's done that. And um, sometimes uh, you get a police officer and they assume you are basically a law-abiding citizen and they give you some helpful guidance they send you on your way. Their intentions are pure and selfless. They look first to de-escalate any potential conflict. They want you to succeed and do better. They want you to start following and obeying the speed law, right? That's what their main goal is. They have a purpose to serve and protect. And sometimes that involves a ticket and sometimes not. And sometimes they're really friendly and they do all the things that, you know, you see in commercials about how <laughs> the police are supposed to act, right? Um, and then sometimes you run into a police officer that is just waiting for an opportunity to use their authority. And they have a chip on their shoulder the size of a sawmill. And uh, they can't wait to, uh, for you to make some kind of mistake so they can cuff you and throw you to the ground and smash your face into the pavement, right? At the slightest excuse. So there's, there's two ways of correcting people. And one of them is for the ego of the person and one of them is out of the best interest for the person. And I, I, I want to take you, um, I didn't put this in the sermon, but I think that it's an important one. It's the close of James. If you look at the end of James chapter 5 and you go down to verse 19, the end, of the, the end of the book, it talks about how correction is good and beneficial and how it should be used, right? It says, My brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings, him, brings back a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. So it's important to offer loving and kind and correction that is not self-interested and is not based on authority or lording it over somebody, but out of love, right? Because... If you see somebody doing something that's hurting them, you want to help them. Or if you see other people being hurt, you need to act in a loving, compassionate way in order to stop that hurt, right? To stop that pain. And false doctrine, false teaching, that is pain. And that is hurt. Because you, when, when you have a false teacher, you have somebody that is driving people away from the truth. And, and, and you never know, right? In, in Galatians... Uh, the Jews were telling people they had to be circumcised first, and, and they didn't understand even that they were cutting themselves off from the grace of God when they were doing that simple thing. Uh, maybe not super simple, because I would imagine it would be fairly painful, but they didn't understand that they were cutting themselves off from the grace of God when they were doing that and subjecting themselves to the law uh, instead. So, you know, you never know what false teaching is going to do to a person. Um, and we have to love people enough to, to steer them in the right direction. We have to care about them enough to do that. And, and it can't ever be about us and that we're right and you're wrong and this kind of thing. But out of a love and a desire for that person to do better, for that person to succeed. Right? To wish the best for the, for the other and then to do something about it. That is the essentials of what love is all about. Love and action. Um, so, 
What Jesus is saying here in Matthew 7, though, is essentially to take the log out of your own eye, your own, understand your own weakness, your own sin. Humble yourself. Put yourself in that person's position. Don't act like you're better than them, right? Evaluate yourself. Understand your weakness. And then go to that person in that type or that frame of mind with only hope to do good for them. And then you can help them remove that speck. And then you can help them to do it effectively. And that's what he says to do, right? And of course, um, we would want to do it in the way that we would want someone to do to us, right? Matthew seven twelve it says, In everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you. For this is the law and the prophets. So we see, for many reasons, correcting sin in our midst, correcting false teaching is an important function of the church. And that on some level, we all have a responsibility to do something about it if we see it when it's happening. We also see that how that correction is offered is of equal importance. The Bible gives important guidance on our attitude and our heart in these type of matters, and we would do well to obey it. We are called first to love our neighbors as ourselves and to treat one another the way we want to be treated. From that place of humility and kind and gentle spirit, we should offer our guidance. At this time, I would like to offer an invitation. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you will repent and accept his ways as your ways, change your heart and your mind to Christ, if you're willing to be baptized, then God has promised us forgiveness of our sins, the gift of the Holy Spirit and eternal life. And if that is something that you wish to do this evening, I encourage you to come on forward as we sing our closing song, which is Bring Christ Your Broken Life, number 87.